again so much for your grace and mercy. Thank you for your loving kindness. Thank you uh, for allowing us to see such a blessed and wonderful day. You did not wake us up this morning uh, for us to uh, do our own thing, uh, but you woke us up this morning uh, with purpose, intentions, uh, that we are to follow your will. So I pray, God, that we are, are pleasing in your sight and walk in the path that you have laid out for us. Guide us now as we prepare to dive into your word. I pray that your word will fall on good ground and produce fruits of your spirit. Give me now your presence and power to stand on the truths of Jesus Christ that someone who may not know Christ as their savior may come into a saving relationship with him. I thank you, God, for what you have given. Uh, and I pray that it's helpful on today. Bless us and keep us now. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's dive directly into it. Um, we want to, again, go back to Ephesians chapter 3. Uh, Ephesians chapter 3, and we want to begin at verse 14. I don't intend to be long. Um, you know, us preachers have the tendency of saying that, but I really don't uh, have the intentions on being long. But give me at least 15, 20 minutes of your time, and then we can go on. We can go on. Ephesians chapter 3, um, Ephesians chapter 3, beginning at verse 14, um, reading the New King James Version, there you find these words, for this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that work in us to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Um, amen. Word of the Lord is blessed. I want to um, <clears throat> continue in our sermon series on the power of prayer. Um, but today I want to talk about the persons, the person of prayer, the person of prayer. The last time we <clears throat> looked at this text, uh, beloved, I highlighted the fact that this text in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21, is a prayer. It's the second prayer in the book of Ephesians. The first prayer of Ephesians can be found in chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. And there, Paul prays that all believers might progress toward maturity and fully appreciate the greatness and power of their salvation. So in his first prayer, he prays for spiritual wisdom. But in chapter 3, verses 14 through 21, Paul's prayer is for the Holy Spirit's power to fill every believer, watch, to fill every believer in order for us to live out the realities of the blessings we have in Christ. So in chapter 1, Paul's prayer is a prayer for enlightenment. And in chapter 3, Paul's prayer is a prayer for enablement. In chapter one, Paul's prayer is a prayer for revelation. And in chapter three, 
it's a prayer for realization. Again, in chapter one, Paul's prayer is a prayer for us to know what we are. And in chapter three, Paul's prayer is for us to be what we know we are. In chapter one, Paul's prayer is for us, is a prayer for us to know the power of God. While in chapter three, Paul's prayer is a prayer for us to experience the power of God. So in short, beloved, you can't only focus on chapter three without going back to chapter one. And you can't only focus on chapter one without going to chapter three, because hear me, because the character of our walk in the last three chapters of Ephesians, chapter four, five, and six, is intimately related and connected to a proper understanding of the doctrine, doctrinal truth in the first three chapters. You cannot have one without the other. They go together. Both prayers matter because privileges of the believer also leads to responsibilities of the believer. Did you get that? Privilege of the believer also lead to responsibilities of the believers. So in other words, just because you're on your way to heaven does not mean you can just live your life however you want to live your life. Heavenly standings also mean a worthy earthly walk. So both prayers of Ephesians matter. Again, Chapter three, verses 14 through 21 is Paul's second prayer. As I stated the last time we looked at this prayer, Paul's prayer to me reveals four points. The posture of prayer, the person of prayer, the petition of prayer, and the praise of prayer. Let me say that again. Paul's prayer, in Ephesians chapter three, verses 14 through 21 reveals four points. The posture of prayer, the person of prayer, the petition of prayer, and the praise of prayer. We already look at the posture of prayer where the text says, for this reason, I bow my knees to the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now I told you two weeks ago that bowing the knee uh, is an act of reverence, respect, and an act of submission to the person in whose presence we drop our knees to. So again, to bend one's knees as a symbol of religious devotion is not instructing us on a physical posture that's necessary for prayer, but instead it suggests an attitude of submission, reverence, and passion. So it's, it's in essence saying that God, whatever you desire for my life is exactly what I also desire for my life. It's saying that God, what you think is best for me is also what I think is best for me. Watch again, the thing about the posture of prayer uh, is that it's not necessarily what you do with your body during prayer, but it's more important about what is, is what you do with your heart during prayer. In other words, <laughs> you can bow, you can stand, you can uh, flip, you can lay prostrate, you can roll, you can do whatever you want to do that you think is necessary for you to pray. But if your heart is not in the right position, everything you say to God really does not matter. Hear me, church. Be careful. I told you this before. Be careful of falling into the trap of externally bending your knee, but internally failing to bend your heart. Be careful of performing in your prayer 
so that people can see and know what you do while you're not seen by God. I brought scripture to back me up on that. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23, Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my father in heaven, verse 22 says, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name? Verse 23 is, is a scary text because it says, after they lay out their list of all the things that they say that they have done in the name of the Lord, Listen to what Jesus says, he says to them. He says, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I wonder, church, I wonder how many church folks feel lost and confused and out of place because they had a shallow relationship with God that was all based on performance, all based on the external stuff. And now they cannot perform like they used to since the pandemic shut worship down. They can't shout, they can't dance, they can't showcase their, their, their new outfit, they can't sing on the riff they want to, they can't speak in tongues and perform as if they are on stage all externality. Again, be careful of falling into the trap of externally bending your knee, but fail to internally give God your heart. God looks at your heart and not what's in your hand. God looks at the posture of your heart and not the posture of your body. But that was the posture of Paul's prayer. But there's also what I want to get to today, the person of Paul's prayer. The person of Paul's prayer. Look at verses 14 and 15. It says there again, for this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Paul says in the text that I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, when Paul says Father, not to play with anyone's intelligence that's watching, but he's speaking of God as our heavenly Father. This word Father in the Greek language is pronounced patea, patea. Patea or father speaks of the supreme deity who is responsible for the origin, watch, who is responsible for the origin and care of everything that exists. It is one of the titles for God and is a name which combines the aspects of supernatural authority and divine love for his children. Father Church is God's family name, which can be used in the full sense of the word, watch, only by his children though, only by those who are in the family having been born again by the spirit of God. Watch, if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have been adopted into the family of Jesus Christ. If you have been accepted as your Lord and Savior, you have been adopted into the family, watch. And this God who Paul calls Father, watch, is also your father too. <laughs> Let me say it now. Happy Father's Day. <laughs> Happy Father's Day. Are y'all getting this? I don't think we fully understand what's happening here in this text. Watch. Paul is not teaching that God is the spiritual father of every being in the universe. 
Uh, although God is the creator of all things, he is not the father of all people. Paul does not teach the universal fatherhood of God and the universal brotherhood of man. But there are two, two spiritual families with two spiritual fathers, God and Satan. God is the father of those who trust in Christ for salvation, and Satan is the spiritual father of those who do not trust in Christ as their savior. Uh, let me back that up with scripture. In Colossians chapter one, Paul says, verse 12, he says, giving thanks to the father who has qualified us, that father, capital F, giving thanks to the father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love. Verse 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. I hope that since you shouting, because we should be shouting for joy right now because God, our father, look what, he, what he's done for us. God, our father qualified us, delivered us, conveyed us, and he redeemed us through the blood of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And since he qualified us, delivered us, conveyed us, and redeemed us through Jesus Christ, watch, that simply means you and I have been adopted into the family of Jesus Christ. Adopted into the family. What family, Darren? The text makes it clear in verse 14. It says, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 15, from whom the whole family in heaven and in earth is named. We have been adopted into the family of Jesus Christ. Truthfully, I don't want to stick here, but do you understand what it means to be adopted into, into the family of God? To be adopted simply means to, to place one as a son. Adoption speaks of being placed in a position and having rights as one's own child. It means to formally and legally declare that someone who is not your child is to be treated and cared for, cared for as if they're your own child. Watch, there's more to it, including they have complete rights of inheritance. Adoption is all about, hear me, position and privilege. But how does one become adopted? Good question. How does one become a member or get into a family? Good question. Two ways. Of course, the first one is through by birth. One is born into a family by birth but you can also get into a family by adoption. Hear me, if you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, you have, and if you have repented of your sins and asked God to forgive you, based upon what Jesus did on the cross, you are in God's family, watch, by both means, by both birth and adoption. In John chapter three, Nicodemus thought that you can get into God's family by doing religious works and adding up enough merit to impress God. And when he went to Jesus at night, expecting that when Jesus heard of all of his religious credentials, he thought that Jesus would have immediately invited him into the family. <laughs> but he was shocked 
to hear Jesus tell him, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Nicodemus says, well, Jesus, how in the world can an old man be born again? How in the world can a grown man go back into his mother's womb and be born all over again? Jesus gets right to the point and says, listen, Nicodemus, that which is born of the flesh is of the flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is of the spirit. So listen, I need you to understand and marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. Watch, I'm moving on from this point, church, but God already had a son of his own that he loved. God was not sonless. God did not need a son. God did not need a daughter. But because of the blessed privilege of adoption through his son, Jesus, we, both you and I, can now call God Father and become sons and daughters of God. That's good. So why is why is God being your father so important? Now I'm almost done. Paul says, when I bow on my knees and when I pray, he says, I'm not just praying to some senile benevolence or I'm not just praying to some type of heavenly cosmic Mr. Potato Head in which I can bend God and make him into whatever I want him to be. He says, I'm not just praying to a God that needs to call a heavenly meeting to discuss what I need and how much of what I need will he give me. He says, I'm not just praying to a God who when I call him, he just sits there but can't respond to my every need. Uh-uh. He says, I'm praying to the one and only true God who I can call, watch, my God, my Father at the same time. He says he is the true God. John MacArthur, I like the way John MacArthur puts it. John MacArthur says, God did not inherit his authority. He said there was no one to leave it to God. He said God did not receive his authority because there was no one to bestow authority on God. He said God's authority did not come by way of an election because there was no one to vote for God. He says, God did not seize his authority because there was no one from whom God needed to steal it from. And God did not earn his authority because authority was already his. And I echo the same words, church. God did not become God because of somebody else, but God is God because simply God is God. He is the true and living God. Let me say that again. He is the true and living God. I brought my own witness with me. If you don't believe me, Moses says in Deuteronomy chapter six, verse four, he says, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. If I had to put what Moses was saying in the theological sense, it's what's called monotheism. Monotheism. Monotheism is the belief in one true God who is the only creator, sustainer, and judge of all things. That's monotheism. And this is why, church, that both you and I should be shouting for joy right now and have continual confidence that we'll get through whatever it is that we're going through. Here's why. It's because this true God who is the creator, sustainer, and judge of all things, watch, is also the person of our prayer. This true God who is infinite and wise and eternal, and again, the creator and sustainer and judge of all things, is also our heavenly father. And since he's our father and our God, 
take comfort that even in the midst of a pandemic, even in the midst of social unrest, even in the midst of economic downturn, God still hears and answers prayer. Let me just footnote. Um, some translations of the text says, I bow my knees before the Father. The New King James Version uh, says, I bow my knees to the Father. But I got to tell you, I like the word before. I like that word before. That word before in the te text expresses direction. Um, it can serve as a marker of closeness of relation or proximity. So when you look at it, in other words, when Paul says, for this reason, I bow my knees before the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is simply saying that while he's praying, he's praying, watch, he's praying at as if he's directly in the presence of God. He's praying as if God is standing or sitting directly in, in front of him. Y'all do remember where Paul is, right? Let me remind you where Paul is, is at while he's writing this. Paul is not in the comforts of his home. Paul is not in the climate controlled room like we are now, now writing this letter to the church at Ephesus. Paul is not on vacation or taking a, sab a sabbatical somewhere writing this letter. Paul, Paul is not even somewhere on the streets of Rome writing this letter, but Paul is locked up in chains in a Roman prison waiting for his trial. He's being treated unfair. He's in jail for preaching Christ. He's chained to a Roman soldier. He's locked in the cell. He don't know when he's getting out. He's now considered an inmate. And even in the midst of all that, Paul says, uh-uh, Although I'm in jail, although I'm chained to a Roman soldier, and although my situation looks dark and hopeless, I'm still getting on my knees and I'm praying. I'm going to pray to God as if God's standing right here in front of me because my circumstances and my environment does not dictate and determine the outcome of my life. The outcome of my life is dictated and determined by God. And since I'm God's child, since he's my father, I don't have to come before his throne with the spirit of fear and trembling, but I can come before his throne as a child of God with assurance, knowing that whatever it is I'm going through, be it cancer, sickness, financial difficulties, marital problems, a wayward child, unemployment, whatever it is, God is well able to handle my burdens. And I stand here today, friends, to tell you the same thing, regardless of whatever it is that you're going through, don't let your surroundings, don't let your circumstances stop you from coming before the throne of God in prayer. There's power in prayer. Don't let it stop you going before the throne of God. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16 says, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I'm done, but you can have some assurance in your prayer to God that everything is going to be all right because of the grace that God gives. Dr. Cleophis LaRue, preaching professor at Princeton Theological Seminary, says that we know the back pocket definition of grace in that grace is the unmerited favor of God. But he says that there is also what's called the front pocket definition of grace, which is so much easier to reach. <laughs> he says the front pocket definition of grace is simply this. Y'all ready for it? It could have went another way. 
I like that definition, church, because the truth of the matter is it could have went another way. This fall on my head could have went another way. My stroke that I had last year could have went another way. The person who broke in our house could have went another way. Some of the situations that you have gone through in your life could have went another way. But thank God for his grace. Value the person of prayer. Value the fact that the person of prayer loved you so much that he kept it from going another way. Thank God that the person of prayer is also our heavenly father. May God continue to bless you and keep you as you go forward this day. I love you and I will see you soon. God bless you.